للأولين والآخرين إمام المتقين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I have four main lectures in Canada and it's all about justice in Islam I did the first one in Toronto, and now I'm out of ideas. <laughs> so, yeah, bear with me. I don't know if you're gonna sleep halfway. I think the brothers won't sleep because this is something that may offend them a little bit. And when we speak about justice, generally people speak generically justice justice and we want this we want that mashallah very powerful very strong but in essence we need to have justice in our own selves to begin with the one who does not possess cannot give so if you don't have justice in yourself you cannot transmit and give and cascade justice elsewhere therefore i thought of focusing within house in ourselves for example allah azza wa jal says in the quran and of his signs is that he created for you from yourselves mates that you may find tranquility in them and he placed between you affection and mercy indeed in that are signs for people who give thought therefore the most people in need of justice are those who we live with and a man must be just with his wife and as we see today there is great injustice in the way how men, generally speaking, deal with their wives. And the opposite is quite true. But the time is not sufficient for me to talk the other way around. So consider this to be round number one. A man has to be just with his wife by giving her her rights and by being loving and caring and kind while doing so and her rights usually refer to what providing for her housing her rights of dividing the time if she has other co-wives and to live with her with decency and kindness. There are two stories in the Sahih and both of them are interlinked. One story, very famous, you all know about it, when Salman al-Farisi, may Allah be pleased with him, visited his brother Abu Darda they were not siblings, but in the beginning of Islam, when the migrants came to Medina, as a form of solidarity, the Prophet ﷺ made each one of the migrants a brother and a sibling to one of the Ansar, the people or inhabitants of Medina. So this way, they would share with them whatever they had, even to the extent that if one of them died, his so-called brother would inherit him. So, Salman al-Farisi was made a brother to Abu Darda. One day, he visited his brother, Abu Darda, and heard the complaints of his wife that Abu Darda is almost becoming a monk, fasting all day long, and, and praying all night long so he has no time for hanky-panky 
in a, in a sense. So Abu Darda uh, Salman waited until Abu Darda came. He greeted his brother. He invited him to eat. Salman said, you go ahead and eat as well. Abu Darda said, I'm fasting. He said, no, you break your fast and eat. So he broke his fast and ate. They prayed Isha. Abu Darda wanted to start praying Isha, uh, uh, a night prayer from nine o'clock until Fajr. This is every night routine. Abu Sal uh, Salman said to him, sleep. He said, I wanna pray. He said, not now, sleep. So he slept an hour or so, then he woke up again. He said, sleep, not now, not now, not now. Number of times. Until it was like half an hour or an hour before Fajr, Salman told him, okay, let's pray now. Afterwards, Salman said to him, your Lord has a right over you. Your soul has a right over you. And your wife has a right over you. So give each one his due right. So Abu Darda went for Fajr told the Prophet what Salman said. The Prophet said, Salman told you the truth. In an exact similar incident, there was another companion by the name of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased, with him and with his father, who was a newlywed. His father, Amr ibn al-As, one of the smartest men of Arabia, a couple of weeks later, came to visit his daughter-in-law. So he asked, how is my son with you? She said, MashaAllah, he's the best of men. Fasts all day, prays all night. Amr immediately clicked and understood the message. The woman did not complain, but he understood that he's not doing his duties as a husband and as a man because he's consumed in worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal. So he complained to the Prophet about his son's behavior. And the Prophet ﷺ summoned him in. So he came and he asked him. Then the Prophet said exactly, almost the exact same thing. He said to him, Ya Abdullah, your body has a right over you. Your eyes have a right over you. Your wife has a right over you. And your visitors have a right over you. So give each its due right. This is what is known as the golden rule of happiness in life. And this is, sum in, yeah, this is summarized in being balanced. And if a person balances his time and efforts in such a fashion, he would be fair to his own health, to his own family, to his own social activities and to his financial well-being because he's distributing everything at the right time. But this is not our topic. Our topic, how to be fair and just with your wife. Now, everywhere you read in the Quran, وَعَاشِرُوهُنَّ بالمعروف. And in the Sunnah, the same rhetoric. The Prophet is telling us, Allah Azza wa Jal before that is telling us, commanding us to be kind and to live with our spouse in a decent manner. Most men and women think that marriage is all about rights and responsibilities. One plus one equals two. It is like an auditor. Whenever a dispute happens, what did I do and what did you do? And they start to check and balance. And this is not correct. When you have to live with your wife in kindness and in a decent fashion, in an honorable way, it means that you love for her what you love for yourself. So don't start pointing the finger and say, you should have done this, you should have done that. Rather, look if your sister or daughter were to be treated in the same fashion, how would you feel? If you were 
a wife and your husband was treating you in the same fashion, how would you feel? We tend never to think in this way. And this is one of the traits and characteristics of a true believer. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu salam, Iman is 60 plus branches, which means that if you do not fulfill and complete these branches, you'll never be classified as a full-fledged mu'min. Rather, you'd be Muslim or mu'min that is not that perfect. So you have to fulfill these 63 plus, uh, 60 plus branches or 70 plus branches as in another narration. One of them is to love for others what you love for yourself. And we never think of this. We're so selfish. We're so concentrated on what matters to us and the hell with everybody else. Whether it's in our jobs, whether it's in our own homes, the siblings among themselves. I'm not going to do this. They should do that. I never think of what your country should do to you, but what are you going to do for your country? What Uncle Sam says. This is what we should behave or how we should behave. So marriage is not an equation that is fixed. It's filled with many, many other things that may not be tangible. It is not restricted only to food. I married you. I'm feeding you. You have a roof on your head. Well, when she was at her father's house, she had a better way of being treated. She had more food than what she's having today in your house. And she had a better roof. And she was treated like a queen. So why did you take her from her father's house to treat her like trash? This is not Islam. Islam tells you to fulfill her rights in addition to being compassionate, caring, loving, showing her great deal of empathy, compliment and encouragement. And 99.99 .99 like the Arab elections, men do not do this. They don't, they fail in showing their emotions. They fail in praising their wives and complimenting their beauty, even if she's as a gorilla, as ugly as a gorilla, no problem. <laughs> Say you have beautiful eyes. Gorillas have beautiful eyes. <laughs> Say something that would make her feel good. Even if you do, you're, you're lying, this lying is rewardable. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ, did not permit lying except in three cases. One, lying to your spouse. Not that you're having poker night and you say, listen, I have some uh, overtime to do. No, 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 this is not halal lying. This is haram lying. Halal lying is when she comes out trying a new dress in front of you. And you say, la ilaha illallah. <laughs> I don't know which one is making the other beautiful. You're making the dress beautiful or the dress is making you beautiful. This gives you a pass for six months. <laughs> I've done that. I've been there. Trust me. But when you see her trying and you dress and see, she says, honey, how do I look? And you start laughing for half an hour and can't control yourself. So, oh, I don't know. Is this your granddaughter's dress? You're going to have problems. So you have to compliment her, praise her, give her kind and nice words. Part of being just and fair with your wife is to fulfill the covenant that you took when you got married to her, is to overlook her shortcomings, her flaws, her mistakes, and not to audit every single mistake she does. Because life cannot go on like this. This is a concept well known in Islam. It's called in Arabic, at And it is to overlook the shortcomings. This is strongly 
cemented and, and, and founded, well founded in Islam. It's found in the Quran, it's found in the Sunnah, it's found in the books of Akhlaq, everywhere you go. And the Prophet said this clearly, alayhi salatu wasalam. He says, no believing man should hate a believing woman. If he hates one of her characteristics, he will be pleased with another. Seriously speaking, we have a problem as individuals. I've seen like 70%, 80% of men and women cannot let things slip. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? I have a friend who has a driver back home in Saudi. And whenever he asks him to do something, he court marshals him. I told you to bring a manaqish. Why did you bring this? Why did you bring that? And he questions every single thing he does. And he shouts and his blood pressure goes to the roof. And I say, Akhi, why do you do this? He said, he has to learn. I said, Subhanallah. This is an individual problem. I said, what is his job description? If he could have communicated with you and understood what you said, and executed you, ex not you, <laughs> excuse my word, edit this please, huh? I'm a terrorist. Uh, executed what you told him to do, he should have been an assistant or a secretary, not a driver. Imagine Islam and the beauty of Islam. A man came to the Prophet والسلام, and he said, Oh Prophet of Allah, the servant of mine, and when the Hadith said, says the servant, it is referring to a slave. And slavery is something that is well established in Islam. This is not the time, but I can elaborate on it, but no sugar coating it. So slavery, we have slavery. It's in the Quran, but there is no religion. It's in every religion. It's in every nation before us and after us. But there is no religion on earth that tells you, if you do this, free a slave. If you do that, free a slave. If you uh, swear and, and make a, a, you break your, your oath, free a slave. If you do so many things, ordering you to free all the slaves you have. But a man came to the Prophet and he said, Oh Prophet of Allah, the servant of mine, how many times should I forgive him? They make mistakes. The Prophet did not respond to him. So the man repeated the question, O Prophet of Allah, the servant of mine, he's my slave. I can sell him and buy an, a new one with sunroof and headlights. 2024 edition. What, how many times should I forgive him a day? The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, 70 times a day. A servant making mistakes 70 times a day and you forgive him. Billahi alaykum, I ask you by Allah, our own spouses, wives and, and husbands, our own children, our own colleagues, our own subordinates at work, how many times do we forgive them? Subhanallah. How many times do you, would you like others to forgive your shortcomings and mistakes? A gazillion times a day. So why don't you reciprocate and do the same? Because your iman is this much if ever existing. So this is how you should deal with your wife. In the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ once went to Hafsa, his wife, and told her a secret, and told her not to, cons to, to expose this secret to anyone. So she went behind his back and told Aisha, her best friend, and the co-wife, of the Prophet ﷺ, Allah revealed the Qur'an and told the Prophet everything she said to Aisha. And then Allah revealed this ayah. And remember when the Prophet confided to one of his wives a statement and when she informed another of it and Allah showed it to him, he made known part of it and ignored the part. He went to Hafsa and said, Hafsa? I told you not to tell Aisha so and so, but he did not expose everything that Allah told him. He just told her a little bit so that he would not embarrass her, so that he would not 
make her feel ashamed. And this is an etiquette where the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us how to live with our wives, to look the other way and to ignore these flaws and shortcomings. Now, ignoring the flaws and shortcomings, as, as the Salaf used to say, is عافيه. Is your well-being on, in, in, on this earth. Imam Ahmad said, Al-Taghaful huwa al -afiyah. When you have this ability to look the other way and ignore the shortcomings and the flaws, this is fully al -afiyah in this dunya. Because you will never ever live a happy marriage if you don't look the other way. All those who come to me for counseling, they have half an hour. And I listened to them for 29 minutes. And I could not find the problem yet. They're bickering. You should, no, 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 listen. When I speak, you don't talk. I gave you five minutes to talk. And she's bickering and she, he's doing this. Total disrespect. And we haven't even reached the surface of the problem. How do they live together in one house? If all what they do is pointing the fingers, you did this, you did this, you did this. Well, your mom did this. Your sister did that. And you never stood up for me. Sheikh, he never stood up for me. Since when? 25 years ago, his mother said so and so, and he never, 25 years ago? <laughs> Last week, I don't remember what I had for lunch. And you still, re they remember, Akhi. They have photographic memory. And sometimes it's documented. So be careful. But life doesn't go on like this. Some men don't even forget. And I've seen so many of them doing this. This is part of being just with your wife. To be kind, to be compassionate, to be merciful, to show your uh, uh, praising of her, to compliment her, to encourage her. MashaAllah, the food was excellent, though it was horrible. I admit, it's not fit for human consumption. <laughs> lie. Ya akhi, lie. Give it a shot. You don't want to her to perfect the food, then you become, MashaAllah, uh, uh, the incredible Hulk. Eat one, two, three morsels and just give her dua because tomorrow when you go shopping for the groceries, the first thing she, you come, she says, as usual, you forgot the eggs and the milk, huh? You never pay attention. Honey, I brought 50 items. Yeah, but you always forget the milk and the eggs. And she makes a problem out of it. If you guys can't have chemistry, if you can't tango together, you got to do it solo and this is not good. If you are unable to reach that level of being a good, kind, loving, caring husband, the least you can do is to stop your abuse. Stop hurting her. So don't be too kind, but don't hurt her. How? The Prophet ﷺ was asked, O oh, Prophet of Allah, what are my wives rights over us what are our wives rights over us what are their rights the prophet said and listen he said that you should feed her when you feed yourself you don't go for a rabbi steak well done like uh, three four pounds and you give her uh, chips no you you eat she eats with you and this is what men do usually, they would feed their wife. In, in Arabia, we have a different uh, tactics. Not because we ask for it. Our wives do it willingly and deliberately. When we are eating, the men eat first, and they, the wives take the leftovers. This is our customs. We as men, we tend to put plates uh, uh, of food, clean food. What is this? Oh, this is from my wife. And this shows how you care for your wife. Before you eat, you make her eat. But this is one in a million. Because, and, and women do it because they love their men. They respect their men. They want to honor their men in front of the guests. So you, if you feed, you feed your wife from what you eat. And then he said, clothe her when you clothe yourselves. 
So you don't go and buy fancy clothes and you let her uh, um, strand it without buying it except once every year, maybe one or two uh, dresses and, and that's it. Then the Prophet says, والسلام, and you should not hit her on the face because this is totally haram. Hitting women and men on the face is haram. And you should not curse her by saying, may Allah make your face ugly. And this is not funny because lots of the men criticize how women look. And this is worse than a stab in the heart. Never criticize how your wife looks. Ever. Always compliment her. Always say good things about her. Always make her feel good. Lots of the men, well, you don't see yourself. You've become, subhanAllah, short and fat. You're like an economy pack. Well, what is this? This is not what I got married to. Look at you. you why did you hit the gym? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? But try to eat a little bit less. Why didn't you do something with your hair? Oh, I want you to dye your hair blonde. This kills women. If you go and say, I want you to dye your hair blonde, this kills her. What does it mean? Do you want something else? Rather, never say anything like that. And before you criticize your wife, take a good look in the mirror. <laughs> Some of the men can't even see their toes while standing. <laughs> Some of the men don't even smell their mouth when they say Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah. They don't, they, they, they're astonished. Yeah, every time I pray in the congregation, the man next to me goes like this. Why? Because you smell. When was the last time you took a shower? This is a problem, Akhi. They think that, oh, this is okay. No, it's not okay. Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, used to take good care of his hygiene and how he looks. And when his students said, come on, I, I, this is too much. You're always, you know, taking care of the way you look and you're, you're being so neat and happy. What is this? He said, well, as I like my wife to look good for me, I like to look good for my wife. This is how we roll. This is how Muslims should behave. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, and you should not forsake her except in the house. That means in the bed, not leave the house and go to your mom for a couple of weeks, not attending her and your children like so, peop so many people do. Among the injustice that we have, obviously, among the spouses, something that's prevalent in the subcontinent, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, when they force their wives to live in a joint family. This is haram. Whoa, whoa, Sheikh, this is an overstatement. Haram? We, we're more than like 100 and 200, 300 million Muslims and we're doing haram. Yes, it's haram. This is zulm in the fiqhi encyclopedia published by Kuwait, which is a very renowned source of knowledge. They say that it is not permissible for a man to have his wife living with his parents in one premises, in one house. This is not permissible. Likewise, it's not permissible for him to force his wife to live with a co-wife in the same house. And she has all the right to refrain from sitting, from staying with either one of them, that is one of his parents, because it is his, her right to live in a separate accommodation. And this is the opinion of the vast majority of Hanafis, Shafi'is and Hanbali. So this is her God given right. Now, if we were to move into a different level, if someone has two wives, he has to be fair with both of them in terms of expenditure, in terms of housing, and in terms of splitting his time between them. If he's unable, it is haram for him to get married. And a lot of the men who get married, 
are doing haram to the second wife. They're doing haram. They're unable to provide for the first family, yet they take a second wife. And they force the first wife to pay the bills or to chip in the expenses or the rent. And all of this is haram. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, but if you are afraid, you will fail to maintain justice, then content yourselves with one or those bond women in your possession. This way you are less likely to commit injustice. And this is related to financial expenditure, things that you can be fair in, such as splitting one night here, one night there. But things that you cannot be fair in because it's not within your reach and grasp, Allah forgives this. Such as, you have two wives, one of them treats you like a king, and the other one treats you like a doormat. <laughs> Naturally, you're going to love the one who treats you like a doormat, right? <laughs> no, of course not. You're going to love the one who treats you well. This is human nature. هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ So this inclination in heart is not blameworthy. Allah says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you will never be able to be equal in feeling between wives, even if you should uh, strive to do so. So do not incline completely towards one and leave another one hanging. So this is something that it's human nature. You cannot have this heartfelt inclination equally to both. You have to love one more the other, but you must not show it. You must not express it. No one should know about this at all. And coming to polygyny, as they call it, why would people do this if they are unable to be fair? A lot of the guys that come to me wanting to get married said, Sheikh, We've been rejected from 10 houses. We are proposing 10 houses rejected me. And this is the first wife. I said, why? I said, no, 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 Sheikh. I have a good job. I'm good looking. And I'm religious. But they keep on rejecting me. So this is not logical. Lots of women want to get married. What is it that you're saying? I said, nothing, but all what I do is I give them a heads up. I say, I say in the interview to the woman I'm yeah, uh, proposing to, listen, um, I, I don't want to cheat you. I'm going to marry four. And immediately they kick me out of the house. I don't know why. I said, wallahi, this is the least that can be done to you, you schmuck. <laughs> are, you, are you stupid? Are you out of, my, out of your mind? I said, Sheikh, I don't want to cheat people. Who? told you that you would be able to get married to a second wife to begin with. <laughs> yeah, maybe she will make you happy and satisfied that you would never ever think of marrying again. Why do you put this up front on the menu? How would you feel if she says to you, okay, no problem, you can get married to anyone, but maybe if after the second or third child, I may apply for khular. Why? I just want to pursue my studies. I'm just telling you, I'm giving you a heads up. Would you marry her? Of course not. Why do you put negativity up front? And to tell you the truth, why think of a second wife from an early stage? Lots of the, the guys think that marrying a second wife is being a macho. Sheikh, how many wives do you have? <laughs> I have one. Poor thing, poor thing. I have two. The other guy says, two only? I have three. So what is it? Car collection? <laughs> Souvenirs? It is a difficult thing to do, to be in a, a plural marriage. I've done that for 25 years. And it caused me hell. It, I was fair, wallahi, I was fair yani, to the dot. But I ended being diabetic, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and three stents in my heart. So, yani, it's not an easy thing to do. And it's a responsibility. 
You think it's a, a, a roller coaster or a, a nice uh, ride? No, it's not. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever has two wives and leans towards in, in favor, he favors one of them over the other, he will come on the day of resurrection with half of his body leaning, half of his body tilted. Everyone in the day of the resurrection would know that this guy has more than one wife and he's not fair. Would you be willing to withstand such a, a punishment? And some of the men, when they get married to a second wife, they have total injustice. They abandon and neglect their first wife and the children. He never goes there. He never checks on them. He never uh, speaks. Some of them is so terrified from either the first or the second wife. So if the first wife calls, he answers. And if he was at the first wife's house and the second wife calls, he never answers. He's afraid. Some of them would abandon one of the wives for months without end. Ending up spending lots of the time with the boys, neglecting his first or second wife. Some of them are so intimidated and afraid of the first wife that he does a lot of injustice. Are we good, Wallah? So I have to finish. So, Alhamdulillah, saved by the bell. I have so much things to do, yani, and, uh, but I have to conclude. There's so much, many things to advise you with, out of experience, inshallah, because this is justice that you need to focus. When you have more than one wife, you have to be fair, and you have to draw the line so that you do not do injustice to one over the other. Otherwise, Allah will question you. How did the Prophet ﷺ deal with nine wives? Imagine, and they all fought over him. And they caused him a lot of problems and trouble and headache. How did he deal with that? Did he favor one just to be safe and lose the headache? No. He was fair with all of them. Mother Aisha says, every single day, the Prophet would drop by all of us and he would come to each one of us houses until the night he is with that person, with that wife. So all eight, he would go, Salaam Alaikum, how are you? Salaam Alaikum, how are you? Everything's fine, chit chat with her. And also the Prophet said, alayhi salatu as uh, Aisha uh, uh, narrated, whenever it was sunrise, yani after Fajr, after sunrise, the Prophet would go to his wife's house one by one, giving salam and making dua for them. And then he settles with the one he is sleeping at her house at that day. And, and when it's Asr, now he would prolong this. So he would go to one by one, sits for five, ten minutes, <coughs> chit chats, how is everything, and then goes to the one he is sleeping uh, uh, at her house. And finally, when he got married to Zainab bint Jahsh, may Allah be pleased with her, his, his cousin. After consummating the marriage, he went to visit all of his wives. The same night, after consummating the marriage, he went to visit. And what did he say? He would enter the house, give salam. The wife would return the salam and wouldn't say, how dare you? You cheated on me. You got married again. I hope, I wish, I do. Making dua against him? No. These were civil people. He would give salam. The wife would return the salam and say, how did you find your new wife? May Allah put barakah in your marriage. Dua. Subhanallah. This is how they lived and coexisted and lived a happy marriage. And this is what we should do if we were to have a good marriage, an everlasting marriage, a marriage that, as they say, until death does us a part or whatever they say, truly with respect, with a, a high level of communication and with lots of love and compassion. 
and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Wa sallallahu wa sallam barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Jazakumullah khair, Shaykh. Thank you so, so much for your words um, and sharing uh, such uh, wisdom and hikmah with us. So we are now opening up um, for the next approximately 20 minutes um, Q&A with, um, with the Shaykh. So the QR code is up there. I already been given some of the questions. So um, Sheikh, I will ask them to you, and um, we can go from there. So, um, so the first question is, um, how to deal with difficult people, and what are some ways to practice patience with them? Too generic. <laughs> Be specific and give example. How to deal with difficult people with ease? That's any other, you, you put such a question, I'll give you such an answer. Be as easy as Sunday morning. Don't care what they do, they make life difficult. Ignore them. When a dog barks at you, that's difficult. Are you gonna fall on your hands and knees and bark back? You're a human being, you're much better than this. So when people start to abuse you, eh, let them rise to your level, don't go to their level. And this is the right way of dealing with problems. Don't, you don't have to respond to each and every inquiry. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? So, I did. So, what are you going to do? One of the brothers yesterday asked me, why do you have a bodyguard in the masjid after the, the, the salah? I gave a speech and there was a guy standing next to me. He's a bodyguard. I didn't ask for him. They appointed him. So the guy says, well, Sheikh, why do you have a bodyguard? He said, I can afford it. <laughs> and we moved on. I don't have to go and explain to him and show him this and that. Oh, that piece of cake. A man who was 80 years of age was asked, how did you reach this age and you're healthy and you're fit? He said, anytime someone argued with me, I said, you're right. The guy said, this is not possible. Maybe it's your diet. Maybe you walk. Maybe you said... The guy said, you're right. <laughs> this is how you deal with difficult people. Move on, Akhi. Don't. Life is too short and sweet to spend by nagging and bickering and debating and trying to prove you're right. I'm wrong. So what? I'm wrong. Halas. You're satisfied? Go. Go. Give him a cookie and he'll go away. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> the second question is, my father does not pray Salah, and when I asked him to come pray with us, he always says he'll start tomorrow. I know that uh, I know that is I know that the Islam of one who sorry the grammar is a little off. I know that the Islam of one who questionable, and I want to help my dad. My entire family is practicing, but him. What should I or my mother do? This is a big problem, not with the father, with the son, let alone the Holy Ghost. This is a big problem because lots of such youngsters are so quick to draw the gun and shoot and then ask questions. In the sense that they just want to make his father kafir. He's almost labeling him as kafir. And his mother is kafir. My brother did this, he's a kafir, right? Why, why are you so eager to take people out of the fold of Islam? Why don't you look at the full half of the glass instead of the empty half of the glass. He's not rejecting Salat. He's saying Inshallah tomorrow. And you don't know whether he prays when you go to the masjid on his own. Or he prays in his bedroom. Or he prays when you're at work or at uni. So assume the best. Act with him in the best of fashion. Being diplomatic. Being dutiful and obedient and respectful. Give him a sense of feeling that you love him and respect him, not that you are talking to him from your ivory tower, wanting, Simon says, to be obeyed, wanting to control him like so many of us do. This is why people are rejecting you. Why aren't people accepting my da'wah, my family, my close friends, my relatives? They always reject me because you are wanting to control. Show them that you love them, that you're willing to go out of the way to help them and serve them and give them a year. 
without talking to them about Islam. And after one year, they will come running after you and asking you about Islam. And they'll be convinced of whatever you tell them to do because they trust you and believe you. But now you just hatch from the egg. And now you're telling me to do this and this is haram and this is bid'ah and this is shirk and you're going to hell. And what is this? Nobody's going to listen to you. So do not reinvent the wheel. Go to the basics. Call people with your etiquette, with your moral conduct, with your behavior, with your generosity, with wanting to go out of your way to serve them. Not just to be the religious police. This is halal, this is haram, you're wrong, you're this, you're that. They will never listen to you and Allah knows best. <clears throat> the next question is that um, the person is just mentioning that he was in an illicit relationship for a long time um, and um, now he's changed and he believes that um, that the, the, the lady as well has changed. So is it okay if I talk to the father and do things the halal way? Of course. Fair enough. Absolutely. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Is it haram to cut the beard due to jobs that require you to shave because of safety of your being? And if they tell you to wear a thong, would you do that? <laughs> of course not. See, the issue is that we as Muslims are ordered to obey Allah. And there's no obedience to human beings in disobeying Allah. So I have red lines. So what is the limit and what is the job that would require me for safety to sh shave my beard or cut it short. Come on, Yanni, you're working in with machines? You can put a face mask or put something that would uh, restrain it from going to that machine. You're an uh, um, Air Force pilot, the face mask can fit without any problem. You are a surgeon, Again, this has nothing to do with what you're doing because you have hair <laughs> in the different places. So this is too much when people make an issue out of a no issue. I have my religion to uh, observe and to protect. Because if you don't draw the line, sisters, you're obliged to take your hijab off. Okay, the abaya is too long, don't wear abaya. Okay, the dress is too long, wear pants. And what is this? We're not going to work as hooters. We are here to serve and work a job that pays halal. And, and I'd rather seek Allah's provision in halal anywhere else rather than in a place that would compromise my religious practice. And Allah knows best. <clears throat> the next question is, what should I do if the mahar is an absurd amount that I cannot afford? <laughs> She's not the last woman on earth. You can get four with the same price. Yeah, and some people are so fixated on, oh, they ask for this much mahar. Ditch her and go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, and subhanallah, she, she's not Miss Universe. She is not uh, MMA champion. She is not uh, filthy, wealthy, wealthy. So why would I pay so much mahar? No, the Prophet said, the best blessed in marriage are the least in mahar. So be yani, moderate. Don't go and pay her penny as penny appeal. No, yeah. give her something that is normal and adequate, a thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, this is the norm. How much is the mahar here? If it's cheap, maybe, you know, if you push me too far, I just might. I don't know these days. Yeah, Big money, sheikh. Chicken. Anyhow, um, yeah, I think it's five thousand dollars maybe, it would be appropriate, ten thousand dollars max. But I know people asking for a million. Of course, not now, muakhar. So that they would re restrain him from divorcing. Wallah, when he wants to divorce, he will divorce. He will go let her unattended for six, seven years until she files for khul'ah and writes it off. And this is not fair. Be logical. You're not selling and buying. It's not a transaction. It's a lo long life uh, uh, um, relationship. So be moderate. And again, if someone asks for something that is sky high, she's not the last woman on earth. 
Mr. Zakhman um, Sheikh. The next question is, I think this is more in reference of um, you know food delivery, people Uber Eats, so on and so forth. So they're asking, are you allowed to deliver food of which you do not know whether it's halal or not? Yes. Perfect. Um, no, uh, yeah, yeah, you don't want him to waste time. Yeah. Okay, so if someone says, oh, and you have to check and open the parcel. <laughs> you open parcel, they're gonna sue you and sue your company. The norm is, it is halal until proven otherwise, because otherwise you can't work in the mail delivery. You can would not work for Amazon, parcel delivery. Maybe there's something haram, maybe this, maybe that. And it, it goes on with maybes that you won't be able to function. You have to go with the flow until it is proven otherwise. Otherwise, you're going to make life hell for you. Jazakallah <coughs> khair. Was it open before? No. Okay. I didn't hear it tick. Yeah, I'm very careful. Assassinations and you know. I have a bodyguard. Maybe my, my bodyguard would taste it first. Maybe. And see if he's cheating. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the next question, Sheikh, uh, I'll just rephrase it. It's about um, a man is just asking about the difficulty that society brings if he wants to marry a woman who's five or ten years older and how to deal with the family about that. Akhi, if you're going to take care of what the society says or of, of what your parents say, you're not man enough. Don't. Excuse me, Annie, I know this is offending a lot of you. If you're not a man to marry, don't. You have to take your own decisions. Wallah, Sheikh, I'm still sucking my thumb. I have to ask my mom, can I marry this woman or no? Be a man. If she checks all the boxes, even if she's five, ten years older than you, so what? She's a mature, she's hijabi, niqabi, she glovesy, she is, um, this is a new word I just made now. Um, she is, mashallah, religious, she is a good character, has good character, she would be a perfect mom and a perfect uh, wife for you. Who cares what the people say? At the end of the day, I'm the one who's getting married, not them. So if you're not having this mindset of being a real man, don't. Let your mom marry you to someone she likes. I think the next question kind of, I guess, essentially pivots into, into what you just said. It was um, similar that a brother saying that he wants to marry a convert, but his parents are against it. And what should he do? Converts are different. Some converts don't wear the hijab, wear mini skirts, uh, converts and mix with men and celebrate uh, haram uh, uh, feasts and would probably have no problem in sitting on a table with pork and wine and, and, and having a good time. Of course you have to obey your parents because this woman does not check all the boxes. A convert that checks all the boxes, meaning she is a practicing Muslimah, much more practicing than born Muslim women who don't I'm not pointing at anyone. I'm not looking. I don't even, I don't come at me. I'm just saying this. So some Muslim women don't even practice half of what she's practicing. So definitely go for that revert if she checks all the boxes and she's a good practicing sister. Um, a lot of these are, uh, of course, marriage oriented chef. So this is from a university student. Um, at, uh, at university, he wants to get married. How, how should he approach a sister for marriage, um, especially because he doesn't want to get arranged marriage? You don't. This is called dating. You don't approach a sister directly ever. You don't go to a sister in the college, Salam Alaikum, I like your hijab. Wow, where did you get this? Your shoes are from Prada? MashaAllah, you look, it looks nice. No, you don't ever communicate with the opposite gender ever you're interested in one go get your mom go get your sister to talk to her take her number visit her at her home check her out ask around checks all the boxes then you go and talk to her father but it's not appropriate at all for a woman to go and approach a man uh, excuse me brother are you married 
Mashallah. Or a man approaching a sister, sister, mashallah, I like your hijab. Can I, yani, I'm interested in marrying you. Would you mind giving me your number? This is totally not permissible. Jazakallah khair. Um, the next question is, my husband does not validate my emotions. He gives me the silent treatment when I voice my frustration. How do I deal with this? Book a counseling session. <laughs> no, seriously, this is a big problem. Lots of the men are not real men. They're male, but not men. To be a real man, you have to know how to treat a woman. And I'm talking about communication, respect, how you like others to treat your sister and your daughter. And always put this scenario at the back of your head. Would I like my son-in-law to raise his voice like I'm doing with my wife, with my daughter? Of course not. So always be careful of what you do. What goes around comes around. You're going to treat your wife in a bad way, someone is going to treat your daughter or your sister in even a worse way. So, but again, this really requires counseling. When a woman comes and complains to me, I wouldn't judge for her because she's concealing 90% of the picture. I say, let me speak to your husband. And I speak to the man. When I listen to the woman alone, I say, whoa, your husband needs to be hanged. <laughs> but when I listen to the man, I said, whoa, your wife has to stand in front of a firing squad. <laughs> and when I put them together, 70% of all what they said melt like butter under the sun. Not in Edmonton. <laughs> it doesn't melt anything, the sun here. <laughs> so be fair. You as a wife, before complaining from your husband's behavior, take a good look at the mirror. Why is he doing this? You'll find that so many things you do irritates him and they make him resent you. You need to change your ways and it takes two to tango. Of course with Nasheed, no doof, no musical instruments, but you cannot expect him to be the best of husbands when you are the worst of wives. Change your strategy. If it is always nagging, 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 refrain from nagging and do something else that may make him feel that you've changed. And again, you need to book a counseling session. Shift, the next question is, um, how do I deal with, how to deal with student loans that have riba on the conditions that if you can't pay after six months, there is riba. What about the students that need to do a degree and can't afford it without student loans? Riba is one of the major sins of Islam. It's one of the seven mubiqat, the one that uh, uh, destroys an individual. And uh, Allah Azza wa Jal threatened those who deal with riba by waging war against him and the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So now you tell me, is the necessity of getting a degree justifiable to have war with Allah Azza wa and His Prophet Definitely not. It's best and better for you if you believe in the existence of Allah and the Day of Judgment that you work as a janitor than to take a riba based loan whether you can pay it or not and at the end of the day how many though uh, graduates did not find jobs who are unemployed and how many people who did not get a degree are millionaires or hard workers or good merchants or have restaurants or have businesses Akhi, you go with Allah and Allah Azza wa Jal will provide for you. You depend on your strength, on your knowledge, on your know-how, Allah will abandon you and nothing will come good your way. So there is no compromise or tolerance when it comes with such a major sin and Allah knows best. Sheikh, one of the questions is that there, um, 
a husband's asking in reference of the process of khula that if he wants his marriage to work but the wife is asking for khula how you know what is the remedies to try to stop it and or then i guess what what is the process for it Akhi, it yani again someone who doesn't want to live with you a wife who hates your guts has extreme resentment to you cannot fulfill your marital rights and she would be in huge uh, uh, distress when she's with you she's buying her way out she's giving you your, your dowry and you said no i'm not gonna divorce you i'm not gonna give you khula. do you expect her to stay idle do you expect islam to say okay if you don't want to divorce or give khula, khalas. sorry sis you have to go back of course not this is not Islam. You, whenever you want, I divorce you. Talak, talak, talak. When some of the husbands are AK-47. You, you, you know, you, mashallah, 30 shots in, 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 in five seconds. Divorce, 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 divorce. He hangs up, he texts 20 messages. He calls the parents. He divorces like crazy. But when she wants out, and you try to make life difficult and you refuse. No, no, you have no right to refuse. The Muslim judge or the authorized imam has the right to impose khul' whether you like it or not. <clears throat> Shaykh, the next question is, uh, I've missed a lot of salahs and fasts in previous Ramadans. How do I make up for everything that I've missed? You, <clears throat> you cannot make up for missed prayers that were missed intentionally. The Prophet ﷺ gave us two excuses to make up prayers. One, forgetfulness. Two, oversleeping. And he said there is no expiation for that other than to pray it as soon as you remember it. Meaning that if you've left Salat and skipped it until the time expired for any other given reason than sleeping or forgetfulness, without, which is not legitimate, then you cannot make it up. Why? Because it was made timed Allah Azza wa timed it inna salata kanat ala al mu'minina kitaban mawquta it was prescribed at a specific time can anyone pray maghrib two minutes before sunset yes or no would it be accepted even if he was not knowledgeable of the time even it's not accepted because the time was not due likewise if the time was expired you cannot pray. This is the, uh, uh, the opinion of Shaykh Islam bin Taymiyyah, Shaykh Ibn Ithameen, and the hadith clearly states it. When do we stand in Arafat, in Hajj? On the 9th of the Hijjah. Imagine someone coming to perform Hajj, gets restrained at the customs, and they delay him for five or six days. And on the 14th or 15th of the Hijjah, they set him loose. So he goes to Arafah, wearing his ihram, going to Mount Arafah alone. So, oh, hey dude, what's happening? He said, I'm going to do my hajj. <laughs> Today is the 15th of the Hijjah. Arafah is on the 9th. He said, I know, but they hold, held me and I could not perform it on time. Can he perform it a day later? Let alone five days? No, you can't because it is prescribed at a specific time. So Salat, forget about it, it's gone. So what to do? Ask Allah for forgiveness, repent, show remorse, and offer voluntary prayers. Can I do Qaza Umari? This is in the subcontinent, Qaza Umri. Every time they pray Fajr, they finish and pray another Fajr. What is this? It's for like three years ago, I did not pray. So this is compensating for any Fajr I did not pray. Every single day this Raya Dhuhr, another Dhuhr, Asr, another Asr. This is an innovation and unacceptable by Allah Azza wa Totally haram. Fasting is a different issue. If, and this is one of two scenarios, if I fasted one day, and in the middle of the day, I felt thirsty, looked right and left, nobody's looking, drank and had some milk and some tuna fish sandwich and nobody knows about it this day i broke i started it right but i broke it i have to make it up even after 10 20 years i have to make it up because it's a debt Khalas, time is up no we have a couple because the microphone went so i thought you know okay scenario number two 
from night, tomorrow I'm not going to fast. I'm going to skip fasting. So I did not initiate the fasting. Now this day is gone forever. I cannot make it up because I did not intend to fast it. So the fast you break, you have to make up. The fast you skip from the very beginning, you cannot make it up and Allah knows best. And Sheikh, how about also um, women that are nursing or pregnant during subsequent Ramadans um, uh, about them as well? They calculate the days they missed and eventually after 15, 20 years of marriage, the conveyor belt will stop. So now you're free. You can fast. You have no obstacles. In the past 20 years, I was pregnant, Sheikh. Ramadan came. Okay, you have a, a, a concession. Skip it. The second Ramadan, Sheikh, I'm suckling. Okay, two Ramadan, you'll, you'll skip. Skip it. So that, these are 90 days. The fourth year, Ramadan, I'm pregnant again, Sheikh. Good show. Energizer bunny is still working, mashallah. Keep up the good work. So some sisters, 15, 20 years, they keep on skipping Ramadan unwillingly. Are they sinful? Definitely not. But after 20 years, you multiply 20 by 30, this is what? 600 days they have to make up. What to do, Sheikh? Start making it up. Sheikh, too much. Can I pay? No, you can't pay because alhamdulillah you're fit and healthy. But Allah is the most forgiving, most merciful. If you fast three days of white days every month and every Monday and Thursday, you will be fasting 90 days a year, almost three months a year. So within like maybe four or five years, you would have done all that you would, uh, had owed. And alhamdulillah, Allah would reward you for your pregnancies and taking care of your children and for your fasting. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Um, Sheikh, just I guess the final question here is, um, Sheikh, the opinion on um, cigarettes and vaping, uh, which has become very prevalent. As for tobacco, they used to say, this is grown from the earth. If it's haram, we're burning it. If it's halal, we're smoking it. Of course, this is stupid. Smoking tobacco or chewing tobacco or vaping or electronic cigarettes, as long as the doctors and the physicians say that it is harmful, and dangerous it is haram Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran describing Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمُ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْخَبَائِثِ anything that is khabith that is disliked and not natural and has a bad thing to it it's haram in Islam children when you get them some sodas and to drink, they would drink it and love it. If you give them some candies, fresh juice, they would love it. Give them a puff of a cigarette, how would they feel? Of course, not like Clinton, they would inhale. How would they feel? They will cough, eyes get red, maybe vomit, and maybe faint. This is the norm, because it's not natural. Look, subhanAllah, how shaitan reverses everything and to make it natural people nowadays who suffered in the beginning when they started smoking now find great enjoyment in it the best cigarette you can take is after lunch or while drinking turkish coffee this is oh man i i, I have the world in my hands and this is how shaitan messes up with our heads that this thing that is so disgusting and, 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 and repelling and, and revolting, it becomes something of a delicacy to people. Vaping is haram because the medical uh, um, institutions and, and, and the physicians say it's haram. Scholars also have fatwas stating that it is haram and Allah knows best. 
just just an add on to that as well as what about um, selling of cigarettes or selling of vapes for example anything that is haram selling it and profiting from it is haram inna allaha idha harrama shay'an harrama thamanahu the prophet says when allah prohibits something allah prohibits transacting uh, through it by selling and buying jazakumullah khair thank you so much everyone our q a session is now concluded sheikh jazakumullah khair for your time your wisdom and answering these questions so brothers and sisters now in reference of um, ending the night so the night has ended um, the people who have orange wristbands and brothers only they can now remain in the hall for um, having the, the the session with um, Sheikh meet and greet and so on and so forth so if you have an orange wristband only you can now stay in um, go to the that yeah um, for uh, go to the booth and also now, um, Sheikh Ahmed Shihab, before everyone leaves, we'll be quickly giving an update on the fundraise. Jazakumullah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi No, 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 no. Attention, attention Muslims. Attention, are you going to the Jannah? Soon, soon you'll be in the Jannah, inshallah. Please have a seat. Have a seat, Habibi. Set to play, set to play. Set to play means in Palestinian language, means please, in French. Have a seat, Jazakumullah khair, for only less than five minutes. Thank you. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We did enjoy the beautiful session of Sheikh Al-Hakim. Right now. What did he say? Oh, yeah. This? Yeah, yeah.